good to be back in Calgary and see you guys again today. Um, my family, unfortunately, wasn't able to join me on this trip today. They're busy serving at a church conference happening in Edmonton. So as sad as it is that I'm by myself here this weekend, that I came by myself this weekend, what I found interesting was that my drive here was a lot easier and a lot faster. I didn't have to stop a hundred times for washroom breaks. You know, I was able to, you know, go the speed where I feel comfortable to go. Quick question for all the, all the men here. Which of you drive differently if your wife and your children or your family is with you? Who drives differently when they're by themselves? Yeah, okay. I see these guys like, amen, I'm not alone. I'm not the only one. Okay, good. I drive differently as well. I drive quite a bit differently. In fact, on my way into Calgary yesterday, as well, if my family's with me and like somebody cuts me off, I'll be like, God bless you to become a better driver. And that's kind of the extent of it. But by myself, I sometimes get a little bit more frustrated, a little bit more aggressive. Um, no, not aggressive, a little more assertive. That's maybe the better way to say it. And driving down to Edmonton, driving from Edmonton yesterday, I'm driving Highway 2, speed limit's 110, so I'm going at least that. And I'm in the fast lane, and I'm coming up, and all of a sudden there's a vehicle in front of me, and it's going 100. And I like pull up behind it, and I'm assuming it's going to move over into the slow lane because he's going slow. Slow lane is for slow traffic, fast lane for fast traffic. Most people know that, but this guy doesn't move. And he like just stays going 100. And I think he must have been like on cruise control because he was not going 102. He was like at 100. So he doesn't move. Okay, whatever. I get into the slow lane. I pass him in the slow lane. I wouldn't say cut him off because it was a more of a safe distance, but I like swerved back into the fast lane ahead of him, but not out of road rage, like and not out of anger. This is strictly for educational purposes. I'm trying to help this gentleman to be able to, you know, understand the difference with a fast lane and a slow lane. And I'm so happy I did because after I proceed into the fast lane and I'm going fast and I whip by him, I look in my rearview mirror, and he took the hint. He moved into the slow lane. And I'm like, hallelujah, there's been redemption. And, but really, that's what it is. I, I showed this man the error of his ways, and he made a change in his life. And as Christians, isn't that what we're all supposed to do? Will we enable and empower and encourage others to be the best version of themselves that they can be, including drivers. So I think I did my part, my mission was complete, and all in all it was a really good and fast and safe drive. So it was nice to, nice to come, come to Calgary. I think that sharing the road with bad drivers is something that we all have to deal with from time to time. But I think that we all find it satisfying when when bad drivers get some kind of payback. You know, you probably watch videos on like Facebook or TikTok about bad drivers that will like, cut off an undercover cop and just get busted. The sirens go on, they get pulled over, or somebody that's stunting and, or being a rude driver and then they crash the vehicle. As sad or maybe as wrong as it is, it gives us some kind of satisfaction to know that these bad people doing bad things are having some kind of justice, you know? And our Bible story today is kind of like that. It's kind of like the universe conspiring against the bad guy and giving the good guy a break. And that's what happened today in the story. So I, wanna, I want us to open up our Bibles. Um, before we get into that, I want to quickly introduce what happened. So, our story today is from Samuel, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 26, and it's a story from the life of David. And David was a young man who had suffered for years under his father-in-law. 
And let's just stop there and think about that. Has anybody here suffered under a mother-in-law or father-in-law? If so, you're not alone. David was there. He had to suffer. And, but the difference with him, or maybe the same, he hadn't done anything wrong. In fact, he had done everything right. And Saul was just so jealous of David. And Saul made it his mission to ruin David's life. Saul... Uh, he had, took away his job, his friends, his wife, his home, and David was left as an outcast. He was left as a fugitive, and he was being hunted down by Saul. And, and, and Saul was this king that was becoming more and more paranoid and insane. And that's kind of the background as we lead into our story today. So let's see what happened. It's 1 Samuel chapter 26, verse 1 to 12. It says, the Ziphites went to Saul in Gibeah and said, is not David hiding on the hill of Hekelah, which faces Jeshimon? So Saul went down to the desert of Ziph with his 3,000 select Israelite troops in search there for David. Saul made his camp beside the road of Hekelah facing Jeshimon, but David stayed in the wilderness. When he saw that Saul had followed him there, he sent out scouts and learned that Saul had definitely arrived. Then David sent, set out and went to the place where Saul had camped. He saw Saul and the son of Ab uh, he saw Saul and Abner, the son of Ner, and the commander of the army had laid down. Saul was lying inside the camp with his army encamped around him. David then asked. Amalek, the Hittite, and Abishai, the son of Zariah, Zariah, Joab's brother, who will go down to camp with me to Saul? I'll go with you, said Abishai. So David and Abishai went to the army by night, and there was Saul, lying asleep inside the camp with his spear stuck in the ground by his head. Abner and the soldiers were lying around him. Abishai said to David, today, God has delivered your enemy into your hands. Now let me pin him to the ground with one thrust of the spear. I won't strike him twice. But David said to Abishai, don't destroy him. Who can lay a hand on the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? As surely as the Lord lives, he said, the Lord himself will strike him, or his time will come and he will die or he will go into battle and perish. But the Lord forbid that I should lay a hand on the Lord's anointed. Now get the spear and the water jug near his head and let's go. So David took the spear and water jug near Saul's head and they left. No one saw or knew about it, nor did anyone wake up. They were all sleeping because the Lord had put them into a deep sleep. I love this story because although it's strange that like David stole the king's water jug and spear, this story is amazing because it shows one of the best moments of David. Most of us think of David and like we think of David and Goliath, but this, this story shows the character of David. It shows the integrity of David and I appreciate it because it shows us how he is a role model. And this story was put into the Bible to teach us a really deep lesson about life. Our big idea today is the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And that verse is taken straight from the Bible, um, from uh, Proverbs 9:10. David began, he started with the fear of the Lord, meaning the respect. And based on that respect for God, he used as much as he could. If you've ever wondered what God wants you to do in life, or what his will is for you, remember this principle. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of the fear of the Lord. And just Christians, we don't have to be afraid of judgment. 
are like terrified and fearful of God in that way. We don't need to be scared. Jesus was already judged in our place. This is a fear that comes out of a deep respect for God. Fearing God in the Bible means taking him seriously. And that knowing that as long as you are right with God, everything is going to be okay. In fact, I think that living your life in a way that honors God, knowing that God is watching everything, thing that we do is a super freeing way to live. Because we don't need to worry about what there's, there's been times in my life and especially when I was an early Christian, strange things would happen to me all the time. At, at first I thought it was God to me. And then I thought it was the favor of God. But over the years I've come to it's actually the fear of the Lord. And things would happen like I'd go into a McDonald's to order lunch. And I'm there and I place my order and the, and the cashier's getting me my beverage and my tray of food and she gives it to me thinking I've already paid and I have to tell her I didn't. And this has happened to me so many times. One of the times, it was a manager that took my order and she was so impressed I told the truth that she promoted my, my, my whole, whole meal. There was times I was like buying something at, at Canadian Tire for like 10 bucks, and it costed 20 bucks. And the cashier gives me change for 100. I'm like, wow, I should just smile and say thank you. Maybe this is God's way of blessing me. But no, it's knowing that we have to have the fear of the Lord in our life, knowing that, is, is this going to honor God? God? God knows what we're doing. Are we having the right heart before God? And that's kind of what this message is about today. Have you, any of you guys ever been in a situation where something like that's happened? Maybe you got something free or unjustly, and you have this, this choice to make in the moment. What am I going to do? Take the money and run? Or am I going to be honest and, and show integrity? So I think we've all been in situations like that. And in our passage today, that is the situation that David was in. That's what he was faced with. Verse 7 says, so David and Abishai went to the army by night, and there was Saul lying asleep inside the camp with his spear stuck in the ground near his head. Abishai, uh, sorry, Abner and his soldiers were, were lying around him. Abishai said to David, Today God has delivered your enemy into your hands. Now let me pin him to the ground with one thrust of the spear. I won't strike, I won't strike him twice. David had so many reasons to kill Saul right then and there. There was personal convenience. David's life would have been so much easier if Saul was just dead. There was revenge. Saul had hurt David so much and taken so much of his life. If you've ever read the Psalms, you, you'll, you'll know the sadness that David had, the grief that he experienced. And a lot of that was due to the suffering of Saul in his life. There was self-defense. Saul was camped out in that spot because he was hunting David like an animal. He was trying to kill David. David could have easily claimed self-defense, and people would have understood and accepted that. And lastly, there was a sign from God. The most baffling of all is that God himself had put Saul's army into a miraculously deep sleep. This opportunity was basically handed to David on a silver platter. And to top it off, Abishai, David's friend, would be the one to do the killing. David didn't need to get his hands dirty. It would have been somebody else. But David understood that Saul was chosen by God. And out of reverence for God, not out of good feelings for Saul, David honored God. And he spared Saul's life. Sometimes God gives us opportunities on a silver platter. And I know it's strange. We think, well, God gave me this, I should just take it. But no, sometimes we shouldn't. Sometimes we're supposed to not take those opportunities, but instead ask, what does it mean to love God in this situation? 
Love is the greatest commandment. And the love for God will guide us in all times and in all circumstances. A serious respect for God is the first key to making good decisions in life. So always ask, what is my best expression of love for God in this situation? When the cashier is giving me change for $100 and I pay 20, what is my best expression of love for God in this situation? And then if you're able to know that, you'll be able to do what David did and not just be swept away by feelings or speculations that maybe God wants to bless you. Why else would he have made something so easy? So whether it's God giving us an opportunity to help someone move houses or to teach children's church because nobody else is stepping up to the challenge or whether God's just given you your dream job or you've been accepted into the school that you want to go to or you get asked out by a gorgeous supermodel. Whatever the case is, just because God provides us with an opportunity, it doesn't mean we need to take it. Rather, we need to decide by asking ourselves, will this honor God? The first thing we need to get right is our heart. And the second thing we need to get right is our mind. And yes, it is in that order. And yes, there are multiple reasons for that that I'm not going to go into today. So honoring God, respecting God, fearing God with our heart. Second point today is within a godly mindset, use wisdom. Who here likes to watch life hack videos? There, there, there's some pretty good life hack videos out there. Some of them are dumb and a waste of time. But the thing that comes to mind the most when I watch life hack videos isn't the good or the bad life hacks, but it's this resourceful young man named KB Lame. And this guy is making a name for himself by reacting to, you know, to people's stupid life hack videos. He didn't do anything new or sensational. He simply exhibited some common sense wisdom combined with this funny poker face to become a very rich and famous celebrity. And in our Bible story today, David found a life hack. He found a hack that allowed him to get rid of his enemy without killing him. There's always alternatives. God will always open other doors and give you another way. Our Bible reference today is verse 11. But the Lord forbid that I should lay a hand on the Lord's anointed. Now get the spear and the water jug that are near his head and let's go. For David, love for God meant honoring God's choice for who should be king in that season. So killing Saul was out of the question for David. However, with a godly mindset, David saw an opportunity to preserve his own life while preventing Saul from doing evil at the same time. And in that moment, David made a good choice. He took the spear and the jug by Saul's head. And when he was a safe distance away, he woke up Saul's whole army and he showed them the spear and the jug. And this was proof to everyone that David had been right next to Saul. That David had the opportunity to kill Saul if he wanted to. But because he didn't, everyone realized that Saul's mission to get him was unjust. And there was no validity behind it. So, so Saul's whole mission to kill David was wrong. And when Saul saw his spear and saw David holding his jug, he realized that he made a mistake. And Saul left David alone. And in hindsight, we can see that that was the best possible outcome for David. Because if David had killed Saul, it would have proven everything that Saul feared about him. And Saul would have become a martyr. And someone else would have been motivated to kill David out of revenge. 
but David won the hearts of all the people that day. And he also, when he did become king, he didn't need to deal with all of the consequences that come with killing the former king. So taking the spear and the water jug was the smartest, wisest thing that David could have done. So in our lives, once we have a love for God, we also need to use our brain to maximum capacity. God has given each of us opportunities and resources all over the place. So we need to use our brains to make the most of what God has given us to make the best decisions in bad situations that are gonna give us the best possible outcomes. So make a plan, put it on paper. Don't just go with the flow or say, the spirit will lead me. But when you read the Bible, that is when the spirit is going to lead you. That is when he's going to direct you into the wisdom of God and to be able to, to know what to do. And you make a plan and you bring it before advisors and counselors and other mature Christians, people that are going to support you and encourage you and help you with that plan. And then you take that plan and you check it against God's word and against everything you know about who God is. And that is how we're wise. And that is how we make good plans in life. So to conclude... Don't cut people off when you're driving or make dumb life hack videos. If you remember anything at all, no, I'm kidding. In conclusion, and to answer a message or a question today, how do we know God's will for us? By having the fear of the Lord in our lives, through a desire to honor God by doing the right thing. And secondly, by having a godly mindset and using wisdom to make the right decisions. Amen.